Hello everyone. So today I want to talk about a show that means a lot to me. The show that I was the most obsessed with in my formative years, and that's Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Now, saying Buffy the Vampire Slayer is a mouthful, so I'm just going to call it BTVS, because this video is going to be long enough already. <laughs> I first watched this show when I was about 12, and before I even got to high school, I must have watched it at least 10 times. I absolutely adored BTS, and it's honestly a fictional universe that stayed with me for a long time. I hadn't rewatched the show since my teenage years, but earlier this year I binged it all, and uh, obviously watching it as an adult was different, and I want to talk about it. Because <laughs> there are aspects of the show that like triggered some profound thoughts, I want to say, and I didn't really know how to feel about them. So. I read a few articles online with which I both agreed and disagreed, and um, yeah, we're gonna talk about it. <laughs> First of all, I want to be transparent and admit that there is a lot of nostalgia involved in my perception of this show. No matter how hard I try to be objective, the intensity with which I loved BTVS and its characters cannot just disappear, so just bear that in mind. Before we get started, trigger warning. I will be discussing domestic abuse and attempted rape. So if that is a potential trigger for you, I encourage you to either click off this video or psychologically prepare yourself for a difficult discussion. Also, spoiler alert, I'm going to go into details of the show, so if you haven't watched Buffy already, it ended 20 years ago, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Second thing I want to address before we get started. There are many, many, many things to talk about when it comes to BTVS as the hundreds of essays on the topic may indicate. But for the purpose of my mental health, I'm going to try to narrow this down to a few angles only, because that's just how my brain works. I, I can't do a deep dive and talk about everything, it will, it will break my brain, and that would suck for both me and my therapist. So <laughs> let's start by mentioning the things that I will not be talking about. <laughs> First of all, so many characters in the show, <laughs> so many incredible characters. I'm gonna talk about like three of them. <laughs> So yeah, Willows by Erasure, it's a thing. Oz, such an interesting take on masculinity, it honestly deserves its own video. Tara's death and how it fits into the barrio gay strip. Xander and his entitled nice guy vibes. Xander, I'm, I'm sorry. I just don't think of you that way. I'll try. I'll wait. I'm not gonna get into it, but eggs. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about how Charisma Carpenter was like 30, and I thought I was going to look like that by the time I turned 16. Like, give teenagers real expectations, gosh. Also, not going to talk about Angel, either the series or the character. So I'm not going to address the disgusting age gap. But guys, she is like 15 when he sees her for the first time and like falls in love with her. It's, um, it's pretty disturbing. I'm not going to talk about Joss Whedon and all the shit things he's done. But those are things that cross my mind while watching this show, so I do encourage you to look into them if you're interested. In this video, I'm mainly going to talk about BTVS's failures and achievements as a quote-unquote empowering show for women, and go into some of its feminist criticisms. The main thing that I'm interested in, if I'm honest, is analyzing Spike's character and Buffy and Spike's relationship, because as a teenager, I just shipped them shamelessly, and I thought it would be interesting to look at that relationship from a quote-unquote grown-up point of view. <laughs> so, in the first third of this video, I'm going to talk about BTVS's representation of some of its female characters and how it was both inspiring and yet fit into some very toxic tropes. But the main course of this analysis is going to be about Spike and his complex relationship with masculinity, femininity, violence and love. Whether the storyline of his abusive relationship with Buffy is anti-feminist in itself, and whether he deserved the redemption arc his character ended up getting. This video is going to focus way more on the representation of masculinity than on femininity. And that's because, honestly, there's already so much out there about BTVS and femininity, and I didn't really feel like I had anything new to say. And this angle was also more interesting for me, because uh, as a woman, I tend to pay more attention to female characters in general, and so this was just a more stimulating topic for me to work on. So, if that sounds like a good use of your time, please continue watching, and for those of you who watched Charmed growing up, let's start with a little summary. BTBS is an American TV show created by writer and director Joss Whedon. It follows Buffy Summers, the latest in the line of young women known as Vampire Slayers. 
girls chosen by fate to fight against vampires, demons, and other forces of evil. Like previous layers, Buffy is guided by a Watcher who teaches and trains her, Giles. Or as me and my roommate called him, <laughs> British Daddy. <laughs> Side note, are you watching this as an adult? Um, Giles is just so hot. <laughs> like, I could not believe it. And it's so weird because I vividly remember thinking he looked like a grandpa when I watched this show for the first time. I guess, I guess I'm old now. I guess, I guess that's what happened. But on a more serious note, um, one of the reasons I think I was obsessed with this show growing up is how well it captures the intensity of being a teenager. Whedon said in an interview that BTVS mythologizes the experience of being a teenager in such a romantic way. It basically says, everybody who made it through adolescence is a hero. In the words of Rob Breton and Lindsay McMaster, BTVS takes place in a world where reliable knowledge and agency come not from the authority of adulthood, but from the arcane experiences of youth. They argue that in this universe, adult rationalism is blind, repressive, and in a word, monstrous. Which unfortunately resonates with many children and teenagers. The themes of forbidden love between humans and supernatural creatures is also something that felt very queer in a time when this sort of representation was desperately lacking. The scene in which Buffy tells her mother that she is the slayer after years of hiding is written like a coming out scene. Don't you talk to me that way. You don't get to just dump something like this on me and pretend it's nothing. I'm sorry, Mom, but I don't have time for this. No, I am tired of I don't have time or, or you wouldn't understand. I am your mother and you will make time to explain yourself. I told you. I'm a vampire slayer. Well, I just don't accept that. And the fact that Buffy's mother kicks her out and that she has to live on her own at 17 after that, I think that spoke to many queer kids. Another thing that made young people connect so much to the show is that for a show that was technically about monsters and heroes, there was a rejection of binaries that felt very progressive. As Breton and MacMaster point out, Far from upholding the ideal of human purity in the face of monstrosity, Buffy and her friends instead transgress those divides at every turn, especially in terms of romance and identity. Buffy may slay de- <laughs> What are you doing? Buffy may slay demons, but the boundary between good and evil is endlessly complex for her. The human characters in BTVS are deeply and personally connected to the supernatural. There is no clear and absolute divide between human and monsters, or good and evil. Quitting Breton and McMaster again, the non-human subculture is as much a site of desire as of danger, and the complexities of youth sexuality find their fullest realizations in these seemingly unnatural unions. My cat is just very needy, I, I do apologize. Again, while adults often judge the relationships that threaten the established order, BTVS defends the right to love whoever it is you love. So the queer-coded aspect of the show, as well as its rejection of established authority, is in my opinion one of the reasons the show still resonates with audiences today. The romanticization of going from childhood to adulthood has also aged well, because, well, it was true in the 90s, and it's still very much true now. Growing up is really hard. <laughs> in BTVS, a lot of quote-unquote real-life challenges that people go through at that age are associated with supernatural ones. Graduation happens at the same time as the apocalypse. The use of magic is framed as empowering, but also used as a metaphor for drug addiction. So I really get why BTVS was so incredibly successful. But it did not get everything right. No. <laughs> The purpose of this video is not to give a yes or no answer as to whether or not BTVS is a feminist show. I do think, like many other women who have offered their critical opinions on the matter, that the show has some obviously empowering sides to it, as well as some pretty toxic ones. When you notice that my hair has like shifted from one take to the next, it's literally because my cat is trying to eat it. As F.R. Kesby points out in her article on the matter, it delivers some well-rounded female characters with complicated lives and emotions. It features a series of ass-kicking women who are allowed to be tough and vulnerable at the same time. 
However, its representation of female characters is far from flawless. According to Kesby, although there are some very inspiring female friendships in the show, the dynamic between women is often a competitive one. Perhaps most problematic of all is the one between Faith and Buffy. Faith Lehan arrives to Sunnydale in Season 3 and is introduced as the Bat Slayer. She is by far the most sexualized character in the show, and her sexuality is very much depicted as dangerous. In fact, she is incredibly predatory by 2022 standards. She assaults Xander, nearly strangling him to death in a moment of intimacy, and actually rapes Riley, Buffy's boyfriend in Season 4. This is never addressed as sexual assault, by the way, but it very clearly is. So, the character of Faith falls under the classic association of femininity, sexuality, and danger. She's the seductive and evil crazy woman. She's the irresistible femme fatale. And though she does eventually have a redemption arc, her sexuality is incredibly vilified. Having sex for any reason other than romantic love is not perceived as feminine in our society. And so when women do pursue sex for anything other than that, it is often presented as perverse, predatory, or even evil. What's implied is that when women appropriate something that is seen as masculine, it is transgressive and therefore wrong. The same way that if men seek emotional connection without pursuing sex, they do not adhere to patriarchal models of masculinity and they are pussies or gay. That is of course stupid and untrue. But unfortunately, this is very common in popular media and BTVS is guilty of that. I think it's interesting to note that in season 3, when Faith makes her first appearance, Buffy is in a sexless relationship with Angel, her vampire boyfriend that she cannot have sex with because that might cause him to lose his soul. Which is a very interesting juxtaposition. <laughs> as you may have figured by now, the whole Buffy and Faith opposition fits into what is known as the Madonna horror complex. As Kesby remarks, throughout the majority of season 3, which features Faith as the main villain, Buffy wears a lot of pink, purple, pale colors. She wears skirts, dresses, and florals, while Faith wears red and black trousers and tight leather clothes. This visual opposition is unmistakable, and it really encourages the viewer to embrace the Madonna horror dichotomy embodied by Faith and Buffy. The show does allow some nuance. Faith isn't purely evil, but rather makes some bad choices that apparently drive her insane and turn her into a murdering psychopath. <laughs> the representation of mental illness really hasn't aided well either. <laughs> It is implied that Faith, like Buffy, is a result of her financial and social situation. She never had access to the financial security or support network that Buffy did. But the honorable mention of class struggle does not erase the fact that the majority of season 3 pits women against each other, or that it reinforces stereotypes about how good girls behave and bad girls are punished. So while BTVS has its share of not-so-feminist representation of women, I do think that one of the characters that has aged pretty well is Buffy. She really wasn't this stereotypical main female character. She wasn't a black canvas like Elena from Vampire Diaries or Bella from Twilight for any girl to identify with. And outside of season 3, she really wasn't depicted as some sort of saint either. But while she literally was not like other girls, what made her special was not that she rejected every single aspect of her femininity. To paraphrase Kesby, Buffy was a warrior who trained and fought and killed and saved the world on a daily basis. But she was also into fashion, nails, hair and beauty, and all the other girly stuff that popular girls liked and the misogynist culture of the time despised. As someone who's always been very feminine in my gender expression, I really appreciated that the show allowed Buffy to embrace her femininity without being defined by it. I like Cordelia in Harmony, but I do not have time to get into it in this video. I am so sorry. So, now that we've talked about some of the problematic representation of female characters in BTVS, as well as some of the more empowering ones, let's move on to a character that is both super popular with fans and not very well liked by feminists, Spike. So, Spike is an abusive man as well as a violent murderer. And so, many people find his eventual redemption arc rather problematic. Now, this all sounds like something that I would typically agree with. But, truth is, I don't. 
I don't think the way in which the show handles Spike's character romanticizes domestic violence. I don't think it minimizes the consequences of Spike's terrible actions. In fact, I've got a lot of positive things to say about it. Which, I'm not gonna lie, um, shocks the hell out of me. <laughs> In case you haven't watched the show, Spike is a vampire, famous for having killed two slayers and for torturing his victims in despicable ways. Pre-transition, he was an appreciated romantic poet known as William the Bloody, for his bloody awful poetry. <laughs> Though after he became a vampire, that nickname obviously took on a different meaning. <laughs> Spike is first introduced as a main villain in season 2, but then goes from forming alliances with Buffy and her friends to trying to kill them multiple times. In season 4, he is implanted with a cerebral microchip that prevents him from harming humans. Hence, he literally becomes the dangerous and evil, but harmless bad boy. In season 5, Spike realizes that he is in love with Buffy. <laughs> After which his character goes from stalking and kidnapping her, to eventually gaining her respect, which he immediately loses as they get into a toxic relationship based on sex and violence. After crossing a line in terms of abuse, even by their unhealthy standards, Spike eventually decides to change and become worthy of Buffy's love and regains his soul. Now, <laughs> we will get into his problematic behavior and violence against women. But first, I want to talk about what is so fascinating about Spike's character, especially when it comes to gender roles and gender expression. So let's take a look at what this character represents and how he fits into the vampire figure and the blurring of boundaries between the feminine and the masculine. In their article on the matter, D. Amy Chin and Millie Williamson argue that Spike's sex soul construction rearticulates the dualities which fictional vampires have long embodied, the simultaneous expression of erotic repulsion and attraction, a fear of and desire for the other. They add that, like his fictional ancestors, Spike blurs boundaries and raises ambiguities. Indeed, as they note, Spike is polymorphous. He is both a man and a monster, both masculine and feminine. I will elaborate on this later on, but what I find fascinating is that this duality does not make him whole, but rather makes him fractured. As I mentioned earlier, BTVS explores the idea of what it means to be an outcast in a world where adult rationality is associated with violence and exclusion. Yet, in this universe that focuses on difference, it is Spike who expresses marginality most completely. As Amy Chin and Williamson point out, constantly rejected by Buffy and her friends, he is an outcast in a fictional world that otherwise embraces marginal social identities. Everyone in the Scoobies embraces their difference. Slayer, witch, werewolf, demon, loser, everyone is out and proud. Everyone but Spike. Now, I know that it's a bit much to argue that a cis white heterosexual man is the most othered out of all others, <laughs> but rewatching it, I was surprised to realize that Spike's character explores, through metaphors obviously, what it's like to feel at odds with your gender identity. I don't think Spike is meant to be read as non-binary, but I do think he embodies the struggle of balancing natural things such as empathy and emotions and the desire to conform to a toxic model of masculinity that excludes all that is coded feminine. While Buffy's superpowers give her abilities that are traditionally perceived as masculine, mainly physical strength but also assertiveness and leadership, her femininity is never threatened. She is never masculinized. Though she does seem to regard certain feminine things with a sort of nostalgia, as though they represent what her life should have been about if she had been normal. But when it comes to Spike, it's a different story. He doesn't seek reconciliation between these two sides of himself. Rather, he completely dissociates them from one another, and is never able to embody both at once. When the feminine and the masculine do interact, they are always in conflict. Indeed, as a human, Spike seemed to possess quote-unquote feminine qualities. He was a poet, and therefore in touch with his feelings. He took care of his mother, which implied he was very nurturing. Furthermore, he was a hopeless romantic and emotional person. But when he became a vampire, he lost his soul, and thus disconnected from his emotions entirely. He also became physically strong as well as feared and worshipped, finally adhering to patriarchal masculinity. I think that his inability to conform mixed with his desire for love and validation are very relatable for people who struggle with their gender identity. 
or of their masculinity for cis men. Throughout the show, Spike is on a journey to reconcile the different facets that make him who he is. Maybe this explains his fixation on slayers, as they are able to do what he cannot. Embrace the power that is associated with masculinity without losing their soul, their emotions. I think it's interesting to note that, although his transformation into a vampire helps him get rid of his quote-unquote feminine emotions, which were portrayed as the reason for his social exclusion, he is sired by a woman with whom he falls in love. As a human, he was rejected for being quote-unquote beneath the woman he romantically pursued. But as a vampire, he becomes assertive and emotionless, and only then does he discover what he believes to be love. So, Spike is a very complex character. <laughs> and his relationship to love is just as complicated, as it is both associated with emancipation, gender conformity, but also submission and, most of all, violence. Indeed, Spike is very controlling and dominating in romantic relationships, but also profoundly submissive. Love and pain are synonymous to him. Since it is after being sired by a woman and turned into a vampire that he found conformity and respect, it is as though he mistakes adoration for love, believing he is in love when he feels bested. In addition, his desire for love fuses with his desire for validation. Love sets him free, but also tortures him. First with Drusilla, the vampire who sired him, but also later on with Buffy, Spike craves validation. For the object of his worship to deem him worthy of what he feels. Yet he fails to realize that it is precisely the feeling of being inferior and beneath someone that he mistakes for love. Hence, even as a vampire, Spike's masculinity is always threatened by the submissiveness he performs when he experiences love, something traditionally perceived as feminine. Again, Spike doesn't embrace the feminine and masculine aspects of his character. As I said, they are always in conflict, which is, in my opinion, why he then resorts to violence when the women he is intimate with threaten his masculinity by rejecting him, sending him back to his previous undesired, weak, human, feminine code itself. I am not a psychologist by any means, but I think it could be argued that Spike's abusive tendencies come out in his relationships because he hasn't embraced his whole self. He is either performing the masculine, emotionless vampire or the submissive lover. But as these different traits clash, he feels threatened and then engages in violent behavior as a desperate means to regain power. When it comes to domestic abuse, most of the articles that I read focused on his relationship with Buffy. And that makes sense, as she is the main character. But Spike was always abusive, especially to his girlfriend Harmony that he dates in season 4 and 5. To Spike, love is pain. Whether he is on the receiving end of it, or the one inflicting it, that is the dynamic of love to him. It's a power play. It has nothing to do with respect, trust, or boundaries. Or with actual love, really. Throughout the show, Spike's character struggles with his lack of soul as a vampire, or his lack of empathy and nurturing qualities as a traditionally masculine man, and with his desire to love and be loved. In other words, his desire for validation is in conflict with his desire for love. A conflict that is made even more complicated by the fact that he cannot tell these things apart. Furthermore, as aforementioned, in season 4, Spike becomes incapable of hurting human beings, and thus has to repress his masculine-slash-vampire urges, which can be interpreted as a form of castration. But this does not lead to actual change. He still has the impulse to act out as a soulless creature, but is now forced into domesticity and submission. Of course, repressing anger never solved the issue, and he ends up letting it out on his girlfriend Harmony and later on, Buffy. I just want to take a second to acknowledge that this is such a good metaphor for patriarchal masculinity. <laughs> From an early age, cis men are conditioned to associate their gender identity with violence and domination. We literally teach them to feel validated when they perform toxic behaviors. Yet, as adults, we tell them that they will actually be punished if they act in ways they have been conditioned to believe is their true nature. They are shamed for performing gender in a way they have internalized as their true self. And then we wonder why cis men are so fucked up. So, to wrap things up, 
We can describe Spike's character as a person longing for unity after having been fragmented by his transition, which cut him off from his emotions. Then having to cope with the violent impulse that comes from being a vampire and being chipped or metaphorically castrated. However, everything changes in the final season when, after hitting rock bottom, Spike finally acknowledges and accepts his fractured nature, discovers the true meaning of love and literally saves the world, thus completing his journey as he goes from human to monster to hero. Spike, the outcast of outcasts, finally fits in unifies his fractured pieces and becomes more than just one thing, embracing the vulnerability and strength that come with it. If that is not an incredible redemption arc, I don't know what is. But that leads us to a question that many viewers seem to struggle with. Did Spy's character deserve to be redeemed? Now that I've introduced Spike's character, let's move on to what triggers him to change and redeem himself. What is his rock bottom? What line does he have to cross to realize that he must reject everything that led him to become what he's become? Well, assaulting and attempting to rape the woman he loves. Apparently. So I'm not going to get into details, but in season 5 Buffy goes through a lot. And as a result, in season 6 she's severely depressed. Because she doesn't want her friends to see her this way, she isolates herself from them and enters an abusive relationship with Spike. Violence is their means of communication. It has always been present in their relationship and it only gets worse as they begin to be intimate. She claims to be using him to feel something and both the sexual pleasure and physical pain bring her a form of release as they make her feel alive. While destructive and clearly unhealthy, I don't find the portrayal of their relationship problematic because it's not romanticized in the slightest. Rather, it's framed as an addiction. As something she knows is wrong but simply cannot stop. It's the only thing that momentarily takes her out of her numbness. But at some point, Buffy manages to turn away from this self-destructive behavior and puts an end to the relationship. At the end of the season, in an episode entitled Seeing Red, Buffy is injured. She's running herself a bath and, hence only wearing a robe, and Spike shows up and invites it. She's mad at him, because he's just had sex with one of her best friends and she's understandably upset, and Spike interprets her reaction as an indication that she has feelings for him. He tries to convince her that she needs to admit that she loves him, but she denies it. This scene marked me as a child. <laughs> And I remember being so utterly shocked and confused. Um, he tries to rape her. To, in his words, make her feel love for him again. Being injured, she barely manages to fight him off. And this is honestly such a difficult scene to watch. But yeah, he really comes so close to raping her. And the only reason he doesn't is because she's able to defend herself with her inhuman slave strength. Once she manages to stop him, Spike appears to be horrified by what he's done and tries to apologize, before leaving her bruised and broken, crying on the bathroom floor. And this scene was very controversial. Obviously, I respect everyone's feelings about this storyline. I just want to share my own. It took me so long to realize that what Spike does to Buffy is not out of character. Because for as long as I can remember, the media I consumed served me this bad boy fantasy. Nearly all the TV shows I watched growing up were filled with abusive relationship and toxic dynamics that were framed as romantic. Yeah, he's bad, but she's into it. Yeah, he's bad, but it's okay because he doesn't go too far. He doesn't cross an actual line, and if he does, it's romanticized and portrayed as consensual. This is why this scene is so disturbing. It confronts the bad boy fantasy with what that tends to look like in real life, and that's very uncomfortable. From the little bit of reading that I've done on the matter, a lot of people were upset about the fact that the show went there. But while I agreed with some of the criticisms, I actively disagreed with others. For instance, some argue that to put Buffy in this position of domestic abuse is in itself anti-feminist. 
In her article on BTVS, Deborah Byte denounces the intense levels of violence against Buffy as an anti-feminist contradiction. She claims that in this fictional universe that presents itself as empowering, violence against women has been institutionalized in the sense that Buffy has become socialized to entwine with violence. As the power of the Slayer is not only to be able to physically resist violence, but mainly to accept its inevitability and bear it with a grin. Buffy is the recipient of most of the show's violence. Even with the super strength, her job is to endure each new physical assault. In this sense, the fate of Slayers can be compared to the fate of all women, who are in the end condemned to a life of pain with no choice at all in the matter. Indeed, despite her unbelievable strength, Buffy cannot escape being at the mercy of violent interactions. Even if she emerges victorious, she emerges bloodied and bruised. Now, I wholeheartedly agree with this part of the article. <laughs> Glorifying the strength of women for enduring abuse is so hypocritical and doesn't offer any real solutions. It's like congratulating a rape survivor for being tough. Like, thank you, but I would really prefer we start rejecting rape culture rather than glorifying me for surviving it. Where I disagree with this article is when it comes to the interpretation of Buffy and Spike's relationship. Byte rightfully denounces how creepy and unhealthy Spike's obsession with Buffy is, and while I agree, I don't think it's problematic in the sense that the show agrees as well. Unlike the Edward Collins and Kristen Grays of the world, <laughs> Spike's quote-unquote love for Buffy is constantly questioned, and the twisted ways in which he expresses it are not portrayed as romantic. Until season 7, of course, but we'll get to that in a moment. So, Byte describes Buffy and Spike's relationship as based completely on sexual encounters and control, filled with sadism, violence, and brutality, physical and emotional. He insists to full access to her body on his terms and to suit his whims. So I get where this is coming from. As I mentioned earlier, Buffy always resisted her desire for Spike, even during their consensual encounters. So to say their relationship isn't based on consent is putting it lightly. However, I can't help but feel like there's a little bit of judgment and shaming of BDSM and rough sex in general. This also ignores moments where Buffy is the one to come to Spike and forcefully demand sex. In an episode in which she has become invisible, she actually comes to his crypt without warning and begins to undress him after violently shoving him against the wall as a way to initiate sex. So I feel like portraying Buffy as this submissive character who yields to Spike's coercions is infantilizing and it denies the fact that she had agency in the matter. Agency. Not blame, necessarily, but agency nonetheless. I don't think it's victim-blaming to say that Buffy wasn't entirely helpless throughout their relationship. On the contrary, I think it's a lot more offensive to pretend that victims are all submission and no agency. Being the victim of domestic abuse doesn't erase who you are as a person until you are nothing but a victim. In clear moments of abuse, like the attempted rape scene, then yes, we may need a black and white mentality. Because context doesn't matter in these moments. Nothing the victim has done or will do can excuse or justify violence. But outside of these moments, I find this perception of victims a little dehumanizing. Also, it makes it harder for victims of domestic abuse to identify as victims because no matter how awful the abuse is, they often aren't 100% helpless 100% of the time. Back to the article. <laughs> Byte pursues. The ultimate insult to a feminist icon culminates in the episode seeing red. Spike is frustrated with Buffy. She is finally rebuking his advances and physical demands, and he responds by attempting to rape her. Even with Buffy's super strength and slayer skills, she still falls victim to the horror movie cliché, sexual assault as eye candy for the viewer. She claims that Spike's talking could have been discouraged, his relationship with Buffy could have ended there, and the sexual abuse and attempted rape could have been a storyline that never happened. So I find this really interesting, because what's implied is that Buffy's attempted rape is problematic solely because it happened, not because of how it happened. 
why the writers even decided to create that dynamic is of interest. There was a conscious decision to take this strong character that had survived beatings, heartbreaks and loss and subject her to sexual degradation and harm for her entertainment. So I really get where the author is coming from. But I don't think representing abusive relationships means that you're encouraging them. I mean, it can if it's done badly. But I don't think BTVS portrayed Buffy and Spike's relationship as something romantic, or that they put it there for the sake of perverse entertainment. I think showing domestic abuse can be empowering or reinforce toxic narratives. Again, it depends on how it's handled. So, was this done well? I can only talk from my own perspective. But as someone who has been with abusive partners, my cat included, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Rewatching it as an adult, I was not angry that a strong female character like Buffy succumbed to domestic abuse. In fact, it was kind of the opposite, because, you know, I found myself thinking, um, it happens to the strong ones too. In season 4 and 5, Spike was abusing his girlfriend Harmony. And Harmony sort of embodies the vilification of hyperfemininity. She's Sharpay in High School Musical, she's Regina George from Mean Girls. She's the typical blonde bimbo. She's just really dumb. And her believing that Spike actually cares about her is presented as silly. As though a girl with half a brain would know better. So the combination of that and the fact that her abusive relationship with Spike was never really addressed as such. I was a lot more bothered by this representation of domestic abuse. Because, in my opinion, it made Harmony look bad. In addition to blaming the victim for being stupid enough to be in love with Spike despite how awful he is to her, I also felt like it excused Spike's behavior. As though he was hurting Harmony because he didn't really love her. Because he was so madly in love with Buffy. The subtext being that if it had been Buffy, he would have respected her and treated her well. But then Buffy and Spike start dating, and the show is like, no, no, <laughs> we have been telling you this whole time. Spike is an abusive asshole. True love doesn't turn someone into a good person. It doesn't fix someone's shitty behavior. So I honestly kind of love how they handled Buffy and Spike's relationship in season six. It both showed that you can be a strong person and be in an abusive relationship. You know, it doesn't just happen to the stupid ones. <laughs> And also, you're not being abusive because your partner is dumb and uninteresting and you don't really love them. You're being abusive because you have issues. <laughs> and you can be with the person of your dreams. It wouldn't change anything if you don't put in the work. In her essay on sex and violence in BTVS, Gwen Simons highlights that unlike most depictions of attempted rape, the scene in which Spike tries to rape Buffy encourages a complex audience engagement with both the perpetrator and the victim. According to James Masters, the actor who plays Spike, the action was very carefully choreographed, with the camera alternating between close-ups of Buffy and Spike separately, which forces the audience to engage with both characters' perspective as the camera shifts between the two. When sexual assault is represented in the media, the focus is often more on the victim, and having to experience the violation from Spike's perspective feels additionally disturbing. As an audience, and more generally as a society, we are not often encouraged to identify or empathize with rapists. At least, not when the assault is meant to be perceived as such. Instead, depictions of assault from the abuser's perspective are often romanticized and portrayed as rough sex that becomes enjoyable to the victim once they finally give in. When media represents rape and directs the audience's attention towards the victim, we could argue that it's to create empathy. But I don't think that's the whole truth. I think it also draws attention to what they were wearing, what they did to attract this sort of behavior, how hard they fought back, how traumatized they are. All this scrutiny, while it might encourage sympathy, also invalidates a lot of victims' experiences if they do not identify with the quote-unquote, perfect victim portrayed on screen. Taking a fan-favorite character and turning him into a rapist is kind of shocking. 
Yeah, it shouldn't be really. Because, as I said before, what Spike does is not out of character. He's been consistent with all the other behaviors that made him popular amongst fans. Which forces the audience to acknowledge that we live in a world that encourages violence against women and that glorifies this sort of behavior in men. So, though I understand why this scene was controversial, I really like that the show took this character there. Because men who don't respect boundaries, men that we find seductive because they're coercive and forceful, <laughs> I'm not saying they're all rapists, but I don't find it surprising that men like that would rape. In most popular media, the audience is encouraged to believe that men who display problematic behaviors like stalking, being possessive, or ignoring boundaries would never actually hurt us. <laughs> In fact, men like that cannot rape because they are too desirable. Their problematic traits are so glorified that our desire will protect us from violation. It doesn't matter how insistent and pushy toxic men are. Their masculinity is so irresistible. We'll want them all the time. And if we don't, we'll enjoy what they do to us so much that it will never actually be rape. Nearly all of Buffy and Spike's sexual encounters included a form of rejection from Buffy and insistence from Spike. She was always saying no. But she kept giving it. So we didn't think about consent. Surely he wouldn't have pushed it if she wasn't so willing. Surely. What I love about Spike trying to rape Buffy is that the show had all the ingredients to serve us this bullshit narrative. And instead, they decided to call it bullshit. Spike's speech before he tries to rape Buffy literally exemplifies those romanticized portrayals of toxic relationships. Trust is for old marrieds, Buffy. Great love is wild and passionate and dangerous. It burns and consumes. But BTVS doesn't validate this perception of love. If it did, the speech would be followed by a love scene, not assault. The show underlines how problematic the interest around Spike is, and denounces his behavior for what it is. Not romantic, but fucked up and abusive. So, no, I do not agree with the fact that simply seeing Buffy in the state, bruised and broken after being the victim of domestic abuse, is in itself anti-feminist. I don't think it's anti-feminist to show female characters disempowered. I think what would be anti-feminist would be to portray disempowerment as empowering or fulfilling. However, <laughs> there is another aspect of this storyline that people take issue with, <laughs> and that is the aftermath of the assault, which takes place in season 7, in which we really just focus on Buffy recovering and healing and cutting Spike out of her life. <laughs> just kidding, no no no, uh, we follow Spike's redemption arc and how he deals with PTSD from trying to rape Buffy. I'm not even close to finished. <laughs> so the attempted rape is framed as Spike's rock bottom and triggered to change. He is distraught both that he attacked Buffy and that he stopped. The fractured halves of his character literally blow up in his face. <laughs> the old emotionless Spike would not have backed off, but the feelings he now has prevent him from not giving a shit. Unable to be at the edge of goodness and badness, he has to choose a side. He leaves Sunnydale, vowing to become a new man. And ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> he returns with a soul. So, is it unfeminist to give Spike a redemption arc? Is it unfeminist to forgive rapists? Well, according to my limited readings, the popular answer seems to be yes. And though I ultimately kind of disagree with that, I will read you what F.R. Kesby says on the matter because she makes a very good point. The audience doesn't see Buffy processing the trauma at all. There isn't any real consequence for Spike. He has a soul, he's changed, and all is forgiven. Now, she rightfully highlights that in the current climate, when men, especially white men, are getting away with light prison sentences, if any prison at all, on the defense that he committed a sexual assault when they were drunk and therefore not fully responsible, this storyline is particularly harrowing. And yeah, uh, I can't argue with that. 
Season 7's focus when it comes to the consequences of the assault is on the experience of Spike. His suffering, his pain, his guilt. And the idea that it wasn't really him, because he didn't have his soul at the moment, <laughs> and so he can't fully be held accountable, that sends a very dangerous message. <laughs> and if that's what some people took from this, this really sucks. The implication that your abuser can change and become a new man, and that you are right to put your trust in them again. That is also messed up. <laughs> and I've been there, and in real life, um, people don't grow so overnight. But I'll ask you to suspend your disbelief for a moment here. Because to me, one of the ways Season 7 came across was as a survivor's fantasy. So. We'll talk about real life invocations in a moment. But just for now, I want to acknowledge that for a victim, as a fantasy, it can be cathartic to give your rapist or abuser a redemption arc. I've done no research on this. <laughs> I'm simply speaking from my experience. I'm not saying this is the right opinion. It just happens to be mine at this moment in time. It is not fixed or absolute. I'm literally just thinking out loud. So, in this part of the video, <laughs> I would like to talk about how what I will call the redemption fantasy sort of echoes the more well-known revenge fantasy. First of all, I want to acknowledge that I don't think any of the showrunners had this in mind when they handled this storyline. This is the meaning that I created from my interpretation. But. Maybe the reason we don't see Buffy processing the trauma is that seeing her abuser suffer and experience both shame and guilt helps her heal. Again, this is fantasy land. This is escapism. I have never heard of such a story in real life. But <laughs> from a victim's perspective, it makes sense to me. Because the redemption fantasy makes you feel like the person who hurt you is contributing to the healing process helping you through it rather than leaving you on your own to pick up the pieces. Is it feminist? I don't know, uh, I'm not claiming that it is, I'm not saying that you should try it at home, I'm just saying I understand it. And I don't think I'm the only one. I think looking at another show that deals with rape may be helpful. So I May Destroy You is a show that I'm not going to get into because I already made an entire video about it but it's mainly about showing how survivors deal with rape in an authentic way. Amazing show, by the way. If you haven't watched it already, please go watch it. Actually, go watch it now, because I'm about to spoil the final episode. <laughs> so the final episode is literally about the main character having multiple confrontation fantasies. It's like Groundhog Day, if you saw your rapist again for the first time after they raped you, every time. It's disturbing, but also fucking relatable. <laughs> Because you begin with this fantasy where she kills him, and it's fucking empowering and amazing. And then she has this other confrontation fantasy where she reimagines their first encounter and they have sex in a consensual way. In another fantasy, he is crying and the police come and arrest him. And I really love how this addressed the fact that you don't just experience anger or sadness when overcoming rape. It validates the fact that as a victim, your one and only feeling towards your abuser is not to want him dead. That is a valid feeling. But you may have others, and that's okay. There is no shame in that. I don't think it's fair to label any of these fantasies as more feminist or empowering than the other. Firstly, because I don't think that's the point of fantasies. And also because I don't think these fantasies are as opposed as they seem to be. In fact, I think the redemption fantasy and the revenge fantasy are cathartic in oddly similar ways. When it comes to the redemption fantasy, it's like, what that person did to me was so horrible they cannot live with themselves. They are going through immense emotional suffering as a result of what they did to me. In the rape and revenge fantasy, it's sort of the same. You imagine causing directly or having a loved one torturing or killing or bringing a tremendous amount of suffering on the person who hurt you. I think both are very powerful because they validate the victim's suffering. And also the pain of the rapist becomes part of the healing process. Of course, in the rape and revenge fantasy, the violence is forced on the abuser. 
there is no growth or forgiveness. In the redemption fantasy, the pain almost echoes the one experienced by the victim. It goes without saying that the whole boohoo I raped someone, how can I live with myself, can be super offensive if it isn't dealt with properly. But I wouldn't say that it isn't feminist because the punishment is self-imposed and emotional rather than physical. In fact, to be 100% honest, my idea of justice would be that the people who hurt me become, first of all, conscious of it, recognize what they have done, and then have to live with themselves. Of course, they would need to be held accountable, as well as prevented from hurting anyone else. And in the world we live in, that means prison, hopefully. Of course, I would want society to find them guilty. But deep down, <laughs> what I want most is for them to find themselves guilty. That would feel like justice. In his book about intimacy between men and women, How Can I Get Through to You, Terence Reel says that revenge is at its core a twisted attempt at repair. Beneath the impulse to hurt the other lies a deeper impulse to heal. We want to make the person feel what they have made us feel, so that they might get what they have done and feel remorse. We want to see them on their knees, humbled. We want them sobbing on the floor, begging for forgiveness. So the revenge and the redemption fantasy seem more like two sides of the same coin rather than two opposites. If I put someone through the same pain they have put me through, they will become me. They will feel my pain. But I will become them. In this sense, I think the redemption fantasy is in fact more fulfilling. Because this is just my opinion, but I don't think we want revenge because we want to bring a person pain. I think we want to bring them pain because we want to get that thing from them. That thing that would have kept them from hurting us in the first place. Empathy. The redemption fantasy is soothing because we don't need to become our abuser. To feel their sadism, for them to become us and feel our pain. At the end of the day, revenge is very consuming. And retaliation and cruelty rarely in fact create empathy. And look, I'm not claiming to be on any kind of high horse here. I am in no way above revenge, trust me. <laughs> All I'm saying is that after my own experiences of abuse, I fantasized about killing and hurting my abuser. But I also fantasized about closure and forgiveness. And I don't think it's fair to label either of those things as good or bad. Of course, <laughs> when I talk about redemption and forgiveness, I mean it in like an abstract way. I'm not saying you should get back together or stay with an abusive partner because they're sorry. I really hope this is not how this rant is coming across. <laughs> forgiveness shouldn't be confused with a form of denial where you feel sorry for your abuser. I'm saying this because I know some victims are so deep in denial that they see the abuser as their victim and shift the blame on themselves. But that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Hell, I'm not even talking about forgiving your abuser as a person. I'm talking more about forgiving the abuser that stays with you forever as a sort of ghost. The one most victims have to live with for the rest of their lives. Forgiving the actual person is way more case by case and I have no generalized opinion on that. All I can say is that the people who have abused you should no longer be in your life because that's always going to be a potential danger for you. But I know that's easier said than done. Personally, I am not on speaking terms with anyone who has ever abused me. I've never officially forgiven them. They've never officially apologized. I never enacted any sort of revenge on them by causing them physical harm either. I don't know which would have been most helpful or if either would have helped at all. When it comes to real life, I have no idea if the abuser can play a positive part in the recovery process whether by being harmed or feeling guilt. But I've never heard of that being the case, and that does sound like a very slippery slope. But as therapeutic fantasies, both can be helpful. I don't think the redemption fantasy minimizes the wrongness of the act, and I don't think the revenge fantasy exaggerates the awfulness of it. I think rape is rape, and how we deal with it as victims should not be a feminist debate. Now, This was all about fantasies and their healing power, but what about real life? What can we make of Spike's redemption arc? 
Was it done well? Was it earned? And generally speaking, is it a good message to put out into the world? To imply that rapists can be forgiven? So, in this part of the video, I'm going to talk about how I feel about framing rape as something that is forgivable, and whether or not I think popular media should give rapists redemption arcs. Side note, I'm talking about rape here because although Spike doesn't actually rape Buffy, I think it's pretty clear that he would have done so if he hadn't been stopped. Legally, the two have very different implications, but morally speaking, I think they can be equated in that context. Also, I'm talking about rape in the context of patriarchy and rape culture and how men dominating women is validated in this social context. I am aware that this is heteronormative, <laughs> and that it implies that all rapists are male and all victims are female. I know that this is not very inclusive, and violation of consent is possible, regardless of gender identity. More invisible rapes do exist, and I want to acknowledge that. I'm generalizing for the sake of simplification, but rapes that do not fit this simplified scope happen all the time, and they are valid. So after the assault, Spike has an existential crisis. He cannot reconcile the part of him that feels remorse with the one that led him to disregard Buffy's boundaries. What I find interesting is that instead of doubling down and seeking further disconnection to relieve himself from the pain, instead of going into denial, he makes the quote-unquote hard choice. He goes through a series of trial in order to win back his soul. Metaphorically, he goes through the pain that is required in order to reconnect with himself after years of emotional numbing. The show ends with him sacrificing himself and saving the world, literally earning the title of champion, and being rewarded by Buffy's forgiveness and love. So at first glance, it may be a little bit problematic <laughs> to see a character who has just attempted to rape someone become a tortured hero in a matter of episodes. Getting his soul back may be a metaphor for years of therapy, and the trials he goes through may serve as punishment, but it still comes across as an easy fix. I do agree that the redemption arc is rushed and romanticized, but I don't think it minimizes Spike's actions. Unlike some criticisms I've read, I don't interpret the storyline as rape apologetic. I don't think we can equate the depiction of an abusive man experiencing guilt with what rape apologists are doing. The definition of a rape apologist is a person, or in this case, a piece of media who defends the act of rape, usually by claiming that rape is not a serious crime, or that people do not need to give consent to sex. Which is obviously unethical and infuriating, but it isn't automatically what's happening when rape is represented from the point of view of a rapist. Because, um, rape is not just about the victim. There is another human being involved. In my opinion, Putting the emphasis solely on the victim ends up adding more responsibility on their part, which is very unfair. Furthermore, I don't think victims have anything to gain from this representation of assault. Because again, if you are trying to improve the current fucked up sexual climate, we can't focus on victims only, because to put it bluntly, we're not the ones responsible for changing it. We need to talk about rapists as people, not because we should minimize their criminal actions, there is more than enough of that going on. But because they're the ones who are going to have to put in the work if we actually want things to get better. Dehumanizing sex criminals, no matter how tempting it is, does not really help anyone because... I've known rapists. And... They're not monsters. I wouldn't have trusted a monster. I wouldn't have invited the devil over for a drink. Though I absolutely agree, that rape is monstrous and inhumane, it is perpetrated by humans. And we need to acknowledge this fucked up incoherence if we actually want things to get better. Cause fear of stigma doesn't encourage people to acknowledge and take responsibility for what they've done. In fact, the more shameful the stigma, the stronger the denial. And make no mistake, the only ones who benefit from this massive denial are not victims, but rapists themselves and patriarchy. To get back to BTVS, when it comes to forgiving violence against women, I think it's also important to highlight that though Spike does have a redemption arc, it's not the case for all problematic men in the show. On the contrary, the show also highlights instances where such men are irredeemable. 
In season 6, the main villains are actually three human male characters with no supernatural powers, referred to as the trio. To describe them as briefly as possible, they're pretty much the worst incel culture has to offer. They feel entitled to sex, women's bodies, money and power, because, well, they're men. And in patriarchal culture, that's what men are conditioned to think they should have access to. Warren, the leader of the trio, almost has sex with his ex-girlfriend in an altered state of forced obedience, which would be rape. But he accidentally kills her when she begins to get out of a trance and starts fighting back. Far from forgiving him, the show punishes and condemns his misogynistic behavior. He is literally skinned alive and tortured by Willow, a queer female character. Even though he is underestimated and ridiculed for most of the season, Warren's misogyny is as big a threat as any supernatural creature Buffy has ever had to face. And unlike Spike, he is not forgiven. Not because his actions are worse, necessarily. I mean, they've both killed and tried to rape someone at this point. But because his sense of entitlement is such that he doesn't even question his actions. He feels so superior to women that he believes they deserve whatever happened to them. He cannot empathize with any of his victims. He cannot get out of denial, and so he dies a violent death. So I think the juxtaposition of these two storylines add a bit of nuance. Yes, Spike is offered redemption, but he still needs to work hard in order to earn it. Furthermore, his evolution does not frame his violence towards women as excusable or justifiable. On the contrary, it is the sheer awfulness of what he has done that drives him to change. So to argue that Spike's redemption arc is proof that the show portrays abusers as victims is an oversimplification and not accurate in my opinion. Especially when season 7 uses redemption as a theme through other characters, with Willow and Andrew both following their own journey as they emotionally recover from killing a man. Moreover, it ignores the context of Buffy and Spike's relationship as well. Now, there is never an excuse to force yourself on someone. I hope this much is clear. Buffy is a victim in this situation. Nothing that she has done prior to this event changes that. But I feel like a lot of feminist criticism omits that Buffy constantly abuses and dehumanizes Spike throughout their relationship as well. I mean, she beats the shit out of him. Not to mention the verbal abuse and her calling him an animal and so on. Their relationship is toxic from both ends. This of course changes nothing when it comes to the assault, but I did want to bring it up because I feel like if the gender were reversed, or if there were two women or two men for instance, we would be more tolerant when it comes to accepting Spike's eventual redemption. There is criticism to be made about double standards in the show when it comes to gender and predatory behavior. Faith's character assaults Xander and rapes Riley, yet she's never portrayed as a rapist just like Riley is never portrayed as a victim of sexual assault, most likely because of their respective gender. I would like to end this video by talking about love. As I mentioned, love is Spike's ultimate reward, as Buffy finally tells him that she loves him in the finale. As his character evolves, Spike becomes worthy of love. But more importantly, he is finally able to really experience it. As I was saying earlier, Spike's relationship to love is entwined with violence. Indeed, his desire for Buffy to admit her love for him is what triggers him to assault her. Right after it happens, Buffy tells him, Ask me again why I could never love you. In this moment, she is literally saying to him, This is why I cannot love you. The show directly associates Spike's lack of empathy and respect for boundaries with the impossibility of love. Unlike a lot of popular media that equate coercion and seduction, BTVS tells the audience that violence does not give you access to intimacy and love. And no matter how often it is framed as passionate, the attempted rape scene rejects this romanticization of abuse and calls it out for what it is, which is actually kind of amazing. So in the end, Buffy finally tells him that she loves him. And I'm not saying that it sends a good message, but I think there is a good way to interpret it. Because in contrast to the awful scene in which he assaults her, forcefully demanding her to tell him she loves him, 
This time, he doesn't let her. Instead, he answers, No, you don't, love, but thanks for saying it. He accepts and respects her feelings, even though they will never actually be what he wants them to be. He thanks her for this generous lie, then lets her go and dies alone. In The Will to Change, Bell Hooks says something like, Before men can be able to love, they must let go of their will to dominate. To me, that is exactly what Spike has done. The way that he behaved towards Buffy before he regained his soul and reconnected to his emotions was not love, no matter how much he claimed it was. In fact, let's look at Spike's declaration of love in season 5. In an episode fittingly called Crush. I love you, he tells Buffy, whom he's knocked out and chained to a wall. Chivalry isn't dead. You're all I bloody think about. Dream about. You're in my gut. My throat. I'm drowning in you, Summers. I'm drowning in you. <laughs> that is not love. Or at least it's not love on its own. Like, without respect and trust, that is just obsession. Infatuation. Or, as the title of the episode indicates, it's actually just a crush. Throughout season 5 and 6, when Spike tells Buffy he loves her, she refuses to believe him. Because he doesn't. In fact, right before they have sex for the first time, Spike tells Buffy, I'm in love with you. To which he replies, you're in love with pain. <laughs> and in my opinion, the show agrees with Buffy's vision of love, not Spike's. It doesn't validate Spike's perception of love because he is too far removed from his humanity to even know what love feels like. Now I know that Spike is a vampire who has lost his soul, but I think his struggle to understand love while being so out of touch with his emotions is one that a lot of cis men can relate to. I mean, a lot of cis men I know. <laughs> but once he has a soul, when he professes his love to her at the end of season 7, it is completely different. I'm not asking you for anything. When I say I love you, it's not because I want you, or because I can't have you. It has nothing to do with me. I love what you are, what you do, what you try. This is the only time Buffy doesn't dismiss his feelings for her, and actually believes him. Which indicates that this is the expression of love, validated by the show. In The Will to Change, Bell Hooks argues that Disconnection is not fallout from traditional masculinity. Disconnection is masculinity. If we agree with that statement, in BTVS, losing one's soul, becoming a vampire, is sort of a metaphor for adhering to masculine norms. When he tries to rape Buffy, ironically begging her to love him, Spike dissociates himself from love, as he embodies patriarchal masculinity. But by choosing to get his soul back, he is choosing to reconnect with a severed part of himself. The part that can access, yes, pain, shame, and fear, but also love. This part of a person is presented as feminine, but <laughs> of course it isn't. It's human. Spike, after enacting the most horrible side of patriarchal masculinity, his right to women's body through violence, chooses to reject it and embraces his human, feminine coded side. And yes, in the end, he's rewarded for that. Why shouldn't he be? I am repeating myself so much in this video because I really don't want people to hear this the wrong way. I'm not talking about excusing rapists and minimizing their crimes. I'm talking about not entirely excluding the possibility for forgiveness. So what is the difference between minimizing and forgiving? I'm glad you asked. I'm currently unpacking that in therapy. <laughs> Forgiving involves fully acknowledging the wrongness of what you've done. These two notions are often equated, but they are in fact complete opposites. Because you cannot minimize how awful something is and then expect forgiveness. Again, Warren was full of excuses and constantly minimized his violence against women and the show punished him for it. Of course I think it would be an issue to say forgive all rapists. But also I don't think it's better to say kill all rapists. I mean, it is largely better, but there is still room for improvement. To quote one of my favorite authors, 
If condemnation does seek in the extreme to annihilate the other, then it not only, quite obviously, destroys the conditions for autonomy, but erodes the capacity of the addressed subject for both self-reflection and social recognition, two practices that are essential to any substantive account of ethical life. Don't get me wrong, I want to put every single rapist in prison. Rape is a despicable crime that needs to be punished. But let's be fucking honest for a second. <laughs> what we are doing now as a society is denial on a massive scale. And I am suggesting that acceptance is better. And for rapists to be able to accept what they have done, they must feel like redemption is possible. Not easy, not immediate, but possible. That is my opinion. It is not carved in stone. There are days when I am all fury, believe me. And I don't blame anyone for not wanting to hear about forgiving rapists. I have my days when I don't either, and I'm sorry if any of that made you angry. But nowadays, I don't think forgiving rapists is the problem that we have. I think we say all rapists are monsters, and then we can't find any monsters. So we say, well, it wasn't rape rape, or it was a different time, or she wasn't an angel, and so on and so on. None of that is forgiveness. That is denial. And I think it's very hard to come out of denial when the outcome is dehumanization. Denial is the only option in this current climate. Nobody, no matter what they have done, will ever identify as a monster. I think that forgiveness and redemption have a part to play if we are to come out of rape culture. I think more portrayals of complex characters who evolve and struggle with embracing love as cisgender men can help. I also think that expecting men to perform patriarchal masculinity without engaging in some form of emotional shutdown is in itself a contradiction. I also believe that blaming only individuals for an institutional problem is horseshit. Yes, individuals should be called out and punished for their crimes, but bashing individuals without ever pointing a finger to how pervasive rape culture is, and how sexual violence in men is glorified in our society is ridiculous. As Amy Chin and Williamson point out, the evolution of Spike's character disturbs the idea of the self as a fixed identity that is whole and unchangeable, predetermined, essentialist. It would be so much easier to argue that because Spike is a man, he is violent towards women. But ignoring the fact that we are encouraged to see violence against women as masculine and to see men who enact it as desirable, <sighs> to me that is framing symptoms of illness as the disease itself and taking the solution out of the equation. Of course everyone is responsible for their actions, men, women and non-binary people. But cutting off the head of every single rapist will achieve nothing if our end goal is not to cut off patriarchy's head. So, yeah, I never meant to say, like, go easy on rapists. I really, really hope this is not how this came across. I'm just saying, representation of sexual violence is often very stereotypical, and the truth tends to be more complicated. And so, Spike tries to rape Buffy. And then the whole next season is about him recovering from that trauma and reconnecting with his emotions, embracing guilt and suffering, and then being rewarded by forgiveness and love from the woman that he tried to assault. And I understand how that triggers a lot of emotional reactions. And I think they are all valid. I have to stop in mind, I guess. If anyone's actually finished this, uh, wow, thank you so much. Uh, Mom, if you're still here, uh, I love you. And um, I think that's everyone. So... <laughs> I know this video is already super long, but I really want to take a moment to thank my friends uh, because they, they gave me this new filming equipment for my birthday. My cat is eating my hair. My cat is eating my hair! Bobby! You're such a mean Bobby. But that was such an awesome gift, so uh, thank you guys so much. You're the best. I will link my sources in the description down below. Uh, have a nice rest of your day or night if, like me, you are doing this at 3 in the morning. And bye!